I'm very happy that actually Dimitri Semenov has for a long time already agreed to give this talk about making habitable words and astrochemical perspective. And he will be also leading a working group on this um, on a related field in the cost action on the birth of solar systems, which we have been just lucky to get funding for us. And we will actually probably get a lot of announcements also of him, of activities of this new working group and of this new cost action. Then, so I would like to keep it short here today. Um, welcome again, Dimitri. Welcome all of your colleagues. And I hope you will actually get a very nice um, presentation from about uh, an astrochemical uh, perspective of making habitable words. Please note also that this talk will be streamed and it will be also available on the uh, YouTube site of our European Astrobiology Institute, which um, allows also other people to follow the seminar. And usually the resonance is quite good. Some of our talks have more than 1,000 views. And I'm sure that this will also be very popular. So, Dimitri, welcome again. And the floor is yours. Thanks a lot for coming. Thank you all for introducing me. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, today I will be talking about an astrochemical perspective on the origin of life. Um, Actually, I will skip the origin of life <laughs> topic mainly. I will be talking only about uh, the, the crucial step towards the origin of life, namely how one could form complex prebiotic molecules already in space, even before the, you know, the Earth and the, actually the planetary system has been formed. Um, first of all, here's the outline of my today's seminar. Um, I will give you a brief introduction into this topic and you know my motivation um, doing that and talking about that. And then essentially the most of my talk I will be talking about the evolution of molecular complexity in space, starting from the earliest phases of star formation, namely molecular clouds, which these are the seeds where the stars uh, start to form. Then uh, protostel, uh, protostars and protosteral envelopes, uh, then eventually planet forming environments called protoplanetary or planet forming disks. And then I will be talking about you know, the primitive bodies in the solar system and the early Earth. Um, and also touch a little bit upon the, uh, um, the mechanism by how this, uh, the prebiotic organics formed uh, in space could have been delivered and whether it was important uh, for the region of life on Earth or not. And then I will draw some final conclusions. Actually, it's interesting <laughs> to read some of the quotes of the prominent scientists of their time, which were quite skeptical, studying both the topic of the region of life, like even Charles Darwin himself was not sure that this is good to think about it. <laughs> his famous quote uh, from a letter to his friend, uh, Joseph Hooker. Um, but also, you know, the prominent astrophysicist Arthur Eddington wasn't sure that uh, the topic of the, you know, the, the, the origin of, of, of uh, complex species in space were starting because he said in his beginning lecture that, you know, it's difficult to admit the existence of molecules in stellar space because uh, when they got dissociated, it's kind of hard to imagine how they can, you know, the atoms can be joining up again. And both of them, of course, were wrong. These both topics are uh, the focus of very active uh, research on all fronts from observational perspective by astronomers, but also in the laboratories uh, and uh, by, 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 by theoreticians. Um, and, but, but there are different views, you know, on, on, on this topic because it's very interdisciplinary in the nature. Um, and uh, for example, before the origin of life, uh, you know, top, uh, occurred, uh, there should have been some key elements for life present on the early Earth. And <laughs> what are these key ingredients? It depends whom you ask. You know, for biologists, you know, if you like biologists, for, for biologists, the key elements is the, maybe the components of the, of the, the most primitive cells, uh, prokaryotic cells, uh, for example, uh, like, you know, the bacteria, which consist of membranes, 
and then then cytoplasm and bile molecules and metabolites and a lot of other stuff. But in principle, for them, the membrane consists of phospholipids that consist of you know phosphate groups, then uh, a chain of fatty acids made of hydrocarbons and uh, carboxylic groups. Um, the typical size of those um, fatty acids may be 16 to 20, you know, uh, carbon atoms or so, plus hydrogens and so on. Then another structural units for biologists are the sugars and the, the polymers of sugars called polysaccharides, which is essentially like, you know, form formaldehydes time, times N. And uh, the, the, mono, the sugars usually start when there are more than three carbon uh, uh, carbon atoms in, inside. And uh, for example, you know, the ribose, the oxyribose sugar inside of DNA RNA consists of, of, you know, these are the five carbon sugars. Then of course, there are the proteins, which are really huge macromolecules consisting of, of chains of amino acids, which themselves are essentially a combination of amino group, hydroxylic group, and another functional group. Uh, and then, by the way, all these this structural units are schematically shown in the bottom of this slide. And then beside the proteins, uh, then, of course, there are the molecules that are very important molecules that are part of genes, DNA, RNA, and RNA which are polymers of, uh, you know, nucleic acids, nucleotides, which essentially is a combination of uh, heterogeneous bases. One example is shown in the bottom, plus the pentose of five carbon sugar, uh, which is, has the ring structure and the phosphate group attached to it. Um, so th th that's the view of the you know key ingredients of life for biologists. By the way, the nature somehow uh, prefers using the the specific forms of the you know you know of the nucleic acids and amino acids that's because of the carbon having the degree of symmetry because of his specific hybridization you know all the molecules exist in like at least you know right hand and left hand um, orientation or like mirror copies of themselves sometimes there are more degrees of freedom uh, the life, as we know here on Earth, prefers the right-hand oriented isomers of nucleic acids and left-hand isomers of amino acids, and it's unclear how this, you know, chirality pattern has emerged. Um, on the other hand, for example, if you ask astronomers about key uh, ingredients for life, for, <laughs> for us it's a little bit different. Uh, we are more interested, actually, in the origin of elements themselves. Here is an example from Wikipedia about you know, the natural occurring elements in the human body, but also you know the key ingredients are like oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, of course hydrogen, then phosphorus, sulfur, and so on, so forth, metals, and then some more rare elements. Um, we know as astronomers that most of these uh, elements have, are the products of stellar nuclear synthesis. And uh, at some point, you know, these dying stars where they are, they are produced, they inject those in the surrounding interstellar matter where these elements undergo a remarkably interesting and complex transformation uh, to, to solids, to dust grains, as well as uh, pH molecules, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, and various molecules. And that's essentially what I will be talking about in my lecture. So they undergo this evolution and complexity from the starting point and, and dying stars all the way through interstellar space and then eventually planetary system and sometimes in, in, in life uh, in life or living organisms. Well, uh, actually, surprisingly, <laughs> despite the skepticism of Eddington, we have detected more than 290 molecules today. And uh, this very busy slide you show, uh, you see, you can see them organized in various groups by the number of atoms from, you know, diatomic molecules on the left, all the way to uh, polyatomic species, including more than 13 atoms on the right uh, bottom part of this slide. And the largest molecules we know of are the fullerenes, comprised of 60 and 70 carbon atoms. But a lot of these this molecules have biological importance. For example, among the triatomic species, we have water, which is very important solvent. We also have formaldehyde. And then we have various 
uh, and nitrogen bearing species important for uh, for digestion, for example, for amino acids like HCN somewhere here, okay, HNC or HCN, but also HC3N. Then we also have alcohols, but also aldehydes, precursors of sugars. Then we have the methyl formate and, and so on and so forth, the methyl ether and then more complex stuff over here. So somehow, actually, it's very interesting. A lot of the subunits of this important structural units for biologists, like fatty acids, uh, you know, the 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 the, the predecessor of nu uh, nuclear bases, uh, predecessors of sugars, and so on, could have could form in space. It's very interesting. Um, and by the way, what we call complex molecules here in this lecture, uh, any, is, it is anything with more than five atoms, which is for biologists is, is very unserious. <laughs> um, actually, we have detected recently, several years ago, also the first chiral molecule in space of propylene oxide towards the galactic center. So, um, so there are even you know chiral molecules that the nature can produce without any presence of life. Well, in essence, how do these things can form in this, this uh, very strange conditions of, of, uh, of this dust space where the temperature is very low, there's a lot of EV photons, and also the, the densities are much, 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 much lower than we used to hear the surface of the Earth. Well, the first process that makes actually molecules, it forms first molecular bonds is called radiative association, where Atoms um, or atomic uh, ions can can meet and um, form an intermediate excited complex that have that has a high uh, that has a low chance stabilizing itself by emitting a photon. So it's not a very probable process, but nature can wait for a long time, and uh, these things does a, uh, do occur in space. These reactions, and this is the way how the first molecular bonds are formed. But as soon as they are formed, the first molecules, the fun begins. So these things can be ionized, so we can form from neutral molecules, uh, molecular ions, for example, by far uh, radiation or by X-rays in the vicinity of nearby stars or by cosmic rays. Um, then, of course, then they can also be destroyed by the UV radiation and the molecular bonds can be broken. But uh, then as soon as there are molecules and molecular ions, they very efficiently interact with each other via ion molecule reactions. These reactions usually have no barriers. Um, they also have, if the, the neutral molecules polarizable, they have long uh, distance Coulomb attraction and uh, the probability for these reactions to occur is actually, increase, is actually increases towards low temperatures. Uh, of course, this uh, molecular ions can also become neutralized by the circular combination when they, they meet an electron. For simple species, they got neutralized. More complex polyatomic ions usually destroyed uh, completely into much smaller multiple fragments. And uh, there's also class of neutral neutral reactions. Uh, usually these are less probably slow than ion molecule reactions, but for radicals and open shell molecules, they do occur with without barrier or with low barriers, and therefore they can occur under the very low temperatures uh, in space. Um, well, the products and the rates of these reactions usually are measured in the laboratories. There are very many laboratories doing this, uh, this, this kind of measurements. I have no time to mention all of them. Uh, or via the quantum chemical calculations. So usually the systems up to six, eight atoms can be studied, but anything more complex, uh, in which we actually would be interested uh, from the origin of life point of view, they, they are more harder to do, uh, but eventually probably we'll find ways also to, to, to learn how to do it in the laboratory or via the, the theoretical calculations. Um, of course, um, there is another possibility for this, this um, uh, species to, 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 to meet it, each other and join and form more complex stuff. This is a via catalytic reactions driven by dust grains, which are also present in space and essentially provide the surface uh, for this, this species to meet and, and uh, react uh, with each other. Essentially how it works in, uh, in this low temperature regions in space, um, the molecules can, can stick to the grain surfaces either by electrostatic van der Waals forces or by forming chemical bond with the surface. If this is, for example, a carbonaceous grain. Um, 
And then they can sit there and wait for another molecule to, to land on the surface, either directly on, on them or maybe on another side of the grain. And this, uh, some of these this, um, atoms or molecules, if their conditions are right, let's say the temperature is high enough, they can kind of hop like grasshoppers over the surface, over the surface sites, and eventually find this another reactant to, and uh, these two things could, could react with each other and then, uh, the intermediate product, which is formed in an excited uh, state, can become very easily excited by the excess of energy being absorbed by the dust lattice. And then, or sometimes with a relatively low probability, the, uh, this excess of energy can be uh, used for the reactant to, to become unbound from the dust grain and, and then it goes directly to the gas phase. Um, of course, this ice can also desorb either when, for example, the temperature rises during the star formation process, or if the grain is, is uh, heated by the very high energy cosmic ray particle, or the, the, the molecule on the surface is desorbed by the, uh, for example, UV photon heating it and you know, increasing its internal energy. Uh, the most abundant molecule in space, molecular hydrogen, is formed via this excessively, via this reaction, and therefore is abundant uh, already in a, under very, very dilute conditions. What we call, uh, as astronomers, um, diffuse, uh, diffuse clouds. Uh, by the way, the barriers of these processes, as well as the, the energies with which various molecules are bind to the surface and uh, you know, the energy is for them to, you know, to diffuse all of they, they all also measure or calculate it, um, yeah, the quantum chemistry. This is also to do some complex process uh, um, uh, because you need ultra high vacuum conditions in the lab to do that and also ultra uh, cold cryogenic temperatures. And for the quantum chemistry uh, calculations, one has to simulate a kind of a substantial uh, uh, substantial piece of the surface, which is hard to do. Anyway, now I am switching to kind of the main part of my lecture about the life cycle of matter and space, which closely remember, uh, resembles, you know, the Genesis book quote from ashes to ashes, from dust to dust. I will be skipping this first part here about dying stars and how these freshly formed elements, uh, dust grains, pHs, and molecules, uh, uh, you know, enter into stellar space and uh, when they become part of what we call diffuse matter or diffuse clouds. Uh, eventually, by by some some processes like nearby supernova explosion or some internal processes, part of these diffuse clouds can become. Uh, too compressed and therefore uh, too massive. So they undergo, they become gravitationally unstable and start to collapse. And at some point, because the small submicron sized dust grains are present there, this denser clumps from, from these diffuse clouds, they become completely uh, not transparent to impinging interstellar UV radiation. Uh, so they become shielded from uh, ionizing UV radiation. Plus the dust grains, they're very efficient in the reprocessing this high energy radiation, re-radiating it away. So these dust clumps, which are called dense clouds, or dense cloud cores by astrophysicists, they become also very cold, you know, like 10 Kelvin, sometimes even less. Uh, an example of such a dust cloud that looks like a hole in the sky, this is called B68 is shown here. So you see this, this bright dots are the stars, it's the optical wavelengths, and this, uh, the absorption by these dust grains in this dense cloud core is, is makes it to look like a, a hole in the sky, which is not true, actually. Well, they have a typical temperature of about 10 Kelvin, and the gas particle density is of 10 to the 4, 10 to the 4, 6 uh, particles per cubic centimeter. And hydrogen exists already in many molecular form there. But it's also a crucial phase where first important molecules like carbon monoxide, but also first ices, and this, which is more important for us, the first organic molecules of prebiotic interest, they start to form already in this earliest phase of star formation. Um, well, I, I, I will be talking a little bit about these individual kind of chemistries, so to say, starting with oxygen. Um, in the interstellar conditions, oxygen is has a high ionization potential and exists mainly as a neutral atomic form initially. 
Uh, and then the first reaction it undergoes, undergoes it is uh, uh, it, it should get ionized to you know to to get uh, to get reactive or react with this polyatomic uh, or atomic ions like H plus H two plus H three plus. In 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 essence, this this um, um, H plus H two plus H three plus can be very efficiently produced from molecular um, hydrogen via cosmic rays. And then fun begins. So this oxygen can uh, become charged via the charge transfer reaction, which has a barrier, so it's slow, but does occur. And then it can react with H2 forming OH plus uh, radical or H3 plus uh, molecule can react with neutral oxygen forming again OH plus. And then once OH plus is formed, it can react several times with molecular hydrogen forming protonated water that can then undergo distributor combination is electrons produce then hydroxyl OH or water molecule itself and so on and so forth. This is how, for example, water important uh, solvent for the region of is produced in space already in the very, very beginning. For the carbon, the chemistry is a bit more, uh, is a bit different because it has a low, lower ionization potential than 13.6 electron volt threshold. Uh, and therefore, it can be ionized by far UV radiation, which is widespread in the interstellar space from the massive O and B type stars. Uh, so it is ionized. And then it undergoes the first reactions with uh, either molecular uh, hydrogen or again H3 plus if it is somehow becomes neutral. So we, firm, we first form TH2 plus via radiative situation that's already possible at lower temperatures. Or if it is no neutral, then it can react with H3 plus forming TH plus. So another precursor of, of more heavier hydrocarbons. Well, then, then this hydrocarbon uh, ions, they undergo various reactions with H2 again and form uh, like protonated methane CH5 plus uh, species that then gets neutralized by reaction with, uh, with electrons forming CH3. And then this, this both neutral and ionized hydrocarbons react with each other uh, via what is called carbon insertion and grow inside. So from single carbon uh, hydrocarbons, we go to two carbon hydrocarbons very fast than three carbon hydrocarbons uh, and so on and so forth. This is uh, very efficient, very rapid chemistry that leads to the formation of hydrocarbons and like the precursors of fatty acids important for the formation of the of the membranes. Uh, nitrogen chemistry is tricky. Uh, it is the nitrogen itself has the high ionization potential as, as oxygen is oxygen above 13.6 electron volts threshold. So it's mostly neutral. But the problem is that the first steps are challenging for nitrogen. Um, the reaction with H3 plus does not occur somehow there's a barrier. And then the charge transfer between uh, neutral atomic nitrogen and ionized um, atomic hydrogen has a barrier. So it's slow and efficient, it does occur, but it's slow. But then the next step when the nitrogen uh, is ionized, atomic nitrogen is ionized, this, this reaction with H2 is inefficient. It has a barrier of about 100 Kelvin only happens for ortho H2 and as a reminder, any molecular species with more than one hydrogen exists in two forms at least, where the spins of the hydrogen is oriented differently. It could be a parahydrogen, for example, for H2, when the spins are opposite, or when they're parallel, you know, it's called orthohydrogen, and, and they have different internal energies. Um, and um, orthohydrogen has a high internal energy, therefore can participate in this kind of reaction. But unfortunately, in dense clouds, uh, hydrogen, molecular hydrogen exists in the paraform because it's the lowest energy state. And therefore, chemistry for no, uh, nitrogen is not a neutral, in essence, not ion molecule. The first reaction is with uh, hydro, uh, simple hydrocarbons uh, like CH, for example, forming CN or with CH2 forming HCN, HNC molecule. And then this molecule can also react with atomic uh, nitrogen forming N2, but also NO if it's hydroxyl and so on and so forth. Actually, in dense cloud cores, a lot of these long carbon chains and also cyanopolines, uh, the molecules with the structural for formula HCN, where the N is the number of, of, of uh, carbons and then nitrogen. A lot of them uh, have been detected here. You see on the left-hand side, TMC1 cloud detection of C5H, H2C6, also HC9N. 
so 11 atomic species. And on the right hand side, it's more recent plot from Sakai Yamamoto for TMC1 and Lupus 1A, where these species are shown in the abundance or essentially column density, which is abundance on the line of sight, is shown as the function of the number of carbon atoms. And again, as you see, already in this very earliest phases, we form a very, very complex, for astronomers, complex molecules with more than 11 carbon atoms in size, which also have prebiotic importance. So what about organics? Can they form in the gas phase? Um, and actually, as I showed you, the, for the hydrocarbons, it's not a problem to form uh, in the gas phase. As shown here, this we have the sequence of reactions starting with the relative association between C plus and H2. And then as soon as we form CH3 uh, radical shown here, it can react with atomic oxygen and form formaldehyde with a uh, low barrier, but this reaction is efficient at the temperatures below, like uh, starting at 30 Kelvin, so it does occur in relatively low temperatures in space. But then for, to form methanol, it's much harder. A radiative association between, for example, with CH3 plus iron and water uh, is kind of slow, but more importantly, uh, the, the neutralization of protonated methanol via reactions with electrons uh, is too destructive. So essentially this channel forming uh, just uh, you know, methanol and atomic hydrogen as when shown actually by the experiments uh, by Wolf is essentially zero. It has a zero probability. As I said, uh, this protonated methanol would be shattered into multiple much smaller fragments. The question then arises, can the organic still be produced? And actually, yes, it can by, by different road. As I told you, it is very efficient uh, when it is produced by the surface reactions. Here I show you this, this circle of uh, essentially of cardiogenation reaction starting with CO molecules freezing out onto the surfaces of these dust grains and these clouds. This is um, from our uh, review paper. And as you can see, CO can be very fast and very efficiently hydrogenated all the way through formaldehyde to methanol. And also these individual radicals, if they form nearby of the temperatures are a bit higher when they become mobile, they can recombine and form then uh, aldehydes and uh, for example, a methyl formate quite efficient. So this is the road how uh, prebiotic organics or the, at least precursors could be formed already in the very cold phases. Actually, there's with the low probabilities, this uh, complex organic ices can be desorbed into gas phase where they can be detected with the sensitive radio telescopes. Here I show you a few examples of dimethyl ether, methyl formate, and ketin being detected in one of these uh, uh, cl uh, cold clouds. Okay, what happens next? Well, uh, actually, when after the dense cloud is formed, it continues to contract, and the protostar is formed in the center that starts uh, the fusion uh, process, fusion, uh, fusion process, fusion processes, and uh, it starts produce photons, and therefore it starts to heat up the nearby matter. Due to the consideration of angular momentum, a small disk-like structure is formed uh, around the star, through which the accretion from the infalling kind of spherical envelope uh, goes onto the protostar, and then part of this matter is expelled along the rotational axis in the form of jet and this biconical molecular outflows. And actually, this is the phase when the, the matter starts to get heated a bit, and a lot of this first and second generation organic molecules uh, formed by the mobility of these more complex uh, radicals on the surface or inside it, in this icy mantles and these grains. Uh, I show you the, uh, this wonderful example. Uh, this is a picture made with the James Webb Space Telescope, one of such uh, protostar uh, with a protostellar envelope that is not visible here, it is here. Uh, uh, it's the infrared um, light. This is this dark lane, I don't know if you see it here, is this disk because the system is shown uh, H on. It's the dust in the disk that obscure the light of the central star, which is not visible directly it's somewhere here, but we see like the scattered uh, and reprocessed uh, emission by, the, by this conical molecular outflow here. Uh, this is from the Ice Age uh, uh, program of Melissa McClure. Uh, what happens here is essentially this, this grains covered with the simple ices formed during the dense cloud core phase, they, they, they undergo the collapse 
and they, they end up being closer to the protostar eventually. And on their journey towards the protostar, towards the more warmer and warmer regions, their icy mantles, as I said, become more and more thermally processed. Essentially, what happens is that a lot of uh, more heavier radicals can become mobile and recombine, plus the reactions with barrier, barriers start to become efficient, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, plus, um, the products of this, this complex uh, reactions, they have higher chances uh, to desorb uh, to the gas phase because the temperatures are steadily rising. Um, and the evidence of that um, is then uh, is, the, is the very rich nature of any kind of spectra that astronomers taking of the centers of these protostars, hot corinas, or if they are more massive, we call them hot cores. Where the temperatures are so high, they above 100 Kelvin, that even the water ice uh, goes into the gas phase, and most of the ices I uh, would would evaporate, and there it's much easier to detect them with the radio telescopes. I show here I show here you an example of the protostar that is forming a couple of sun-like stars. It's called Ira 16293. This is the Alma interferometer in Chile that detected glycolaldehyde and ethylene glycolin acetic acid in this, this particular cloud. These are the blue and red peaks here and for acetic acid, this is this yellow small peaks uh, on the left and also here. Um, so precursors of sugars are clearly visible already there. And there are much more other complex organic molecules detected, um, which I don't show you here. James Webb Telescope has also detected this complex organic matter sting, uh, in the envelope where it is still frozen, as uh, is in the dust mantles here. What you see are the absorption lines of various ices. There's this big blue peak uh, is the water stretching Band and here is the water bending mode of the from the you know water frozen to the to the surface. Then this is CO2 feature and another CO2 feature that's CO2 ice. This is CO ice feature. This is the methane. This is the methanol in combination with ammonia and maybe water. This is methanol again. There is another mode of um, of vibration for the water ice vibration mode and so on so forth. But if you zoom in and do the proper uh, baseline um, fitting, uh, you can also detect much more weaker minor features from, for example, propanone and then ethanol ice, then also an acetaldehyde ice and also methane. So now we have the gems where we have an access both to the icy phase of this complex organic molecules and this protostars, but also to gas phase uh, with the radio telescopes. And then we also detected the first organohalogen species CH3 chlorum in, in the same uh, IRS 16293 uh, molecule, which was also detected, by the way, by resolute emission in the comet. Okay, what happens next is that uh, eventually, you know, this, this uh, spherical envelope, uh, you know, uh, accretes onto the star via disk forming the star fully, but the disk remains for a bit longer time. Uh, uh, having much lower mass than the mass of the central star, then the molecular outflow, because there is not that efficient mass accretion any longer, you know, there's not mass, uh, no more mass laying around, sitting around the, the star. Uh, it disappears and the star become visible, it becomes visible. This is an interesting phase where actually these tiny dust grains grow into the millimeter centimeter size pebbles, then eventually rocks, then planetesimals, then embry planetary embryos, and eventually planets. This is the crucial phase where the planetary systems are formed, and it happens after the central star is already essentially fully built up. Um, it's interesting phase, but also a bit complex because um, um, the, the, the matter itself, because of this, this um, uh, the consideration of angular moment is in a disk-like configuration, it is called planet forming a planetary disk, but because of the radiation of the center star, the atmosphere becomes superheated and it's kind of puffs up, it becomes flared. Uh, the, the small dust grains are still there, and therefore they still protect molecules from being dissociated, and they, they also cool off the midplane, and so there is the strong gradient of temperature, so the midplane is very cold outside, 
and then there is this molecular layer where the ices are absent, uh, but the molecules are still protected from UV radiation from the star and the X radiation from the star, and um, easy to detect, relatively easy to detect with the radio telescopes. And then there is this very irradiated atmosphere where the only radicals, maybe uh, atoms, atomic ions, can can survive. It's also um, the phase where the dust grains, as I said, then can grow, then they settle, is a bit like rain droplets become too big, they become decoupled from the gas, and then because of the gravitation, they they go down. But also they experience during this growth process when they become big enough, a headwind from the gas because the gas orbits at subcapillarian speed because of the pressure, thermal pressure gradient in the radial direction, while the dust grains they won't orbit by the uh, is the pure capillarian speed. So there's the headwind which uh, makes them to migrate radially, where they can accumulate even in bigger quantities, become probably gravitationally unstable, uh, at least partially, and form planetesimals in a very efficient manner. So very efficient uh, uh, phase to form planets, but also kind of complex to study and to observe. This is an example how the emission of this pebble sized millimeter grains that are essentially all concentrated in the mid planes of these disks look like. This is the D-sharp large program uh, done with ALMA interferometer at very high angular resolution. What we see here are different disks uh, around sun-like and a bit more massive stars. Um, and as you can see, this dust emission is not homogeneous. There are, you see the spar uh, there you see the, the this ring and gaps, uh, which as we think um, we understand nowadays is due to the dust trapping in the various local pressure maxima, which could be due to the planets already formed inside this, this planet forming disks, which you know push matter around them away, or due to some other mechanisms. Uh, uh, also, interestingly, with the same uh, very sensitive uh, observatory, another large program called MAPT, MAPS um, mapped a molecular emission in five of these this, uh, plant forming disks in various molecules shown in the bottom. I don't know if you have, you have to turn your head to read them. But among them, I, I'd like to show you the uh, acetonitrile and uh, uh, cyanoacetylene, but also HCN emission. So these are molecules have uh, are precursors of prebiotic species um, that we already see. And um, it's a bit harder to see, but they also show that there are some substructures like gaps and rings in these systems. Uh, not so they're present not only in the dust, but also in the gas as well. Um, uh, we have also found an example of at least uh, one clear uh, disk where the planets have already formed. This is called PDS-70. It's shown here. What you see here is essentially the, the light of the dust in this ring. Uh, and the gas actually is present there as well and is chemically rich. And these uh, bright spots are the, actually two planets that are freshly formed. They're only maybe five to 10 million years old. They're still accreting the matter uh, from surrounding uh, gas. Um, and um, there is also like the huge gap uh, in the dust emission, but also in the molecular emission in this system. But uh, there's still the inner disk uh, that uh, present. Um, so it's an interesting system. Like you, we for the first time caught the, the planets being formed right in front of our, our eyes. By the way, these two planets are in mean motion uh, resonance already. And uh, recently, one of our colleagues, Julia Perotti, from the Institute, uh, and she detected water in this innermost region. So I might be, and this, by the way, these planets are like, uh, you know, this gas giants. They're more massive than the Jupiter. Uh, but there, since there are still inner disk with the water, where maybe terrestrial planets are forming or already formed, we don't know yet. But at least we know if they have formed there because there's water there, they, they could have water as Earth on their surfaces. Uh, what else we have detected in this disk, in, which is important for the region of life? We detected methanol, it's the simplest alcohol. Again, with Alma, which we actually explained as the, by as a product of CO hydrogenation of the surface of small dust grains in this disk, uh, which then non-thermally desorbed. Uh, we also detected the first carboxylic acid. Uh, um, that is important for the formation of, of, of uh, as, as if you're a member of nuclear bases, but also, you know, the, the lipids and so on. 
and also amino acids and so on. Uh, also in the disc around TW hydra, uh, which we also found that is a product of the surface chemistry involving more heavy uh, radicals than just CO. So it's probably HCO uh, that is uh, needs to be reactive. Um, and it's also not terminally dissolved. There is another class of this uh, planet forming disks because the accretion is not really homogeneous. Sometimes there's accretion, there are accretion outbursts. They lead to the increase of the luminosity of the center of uh, so, uh, source that heats up the disk uh, significantly. And for some brief uh, moment, the ices, including the scopic organic molecules can become photo, uh, uh, thermally dissolved. And then we can much more easily detect them with the, with the radio telescopes. And one example here is the FU ORI system V883 ORI. Here in this slide, you see the emission in this disk from various organic molecules, well, from C17, all the minor isotopolog of CO, but we also detected methanol and isotopolog of methanol with certain carbon. We also detected acetaldehyde, then we, uh, we detected, uh, you know, uh, methyl formate, acetone, and uh, also acetonitrile and some other organics. These are all these ices that sublimated from the uh, region in the disk heated above 100 Kelvin. Um, so what happens next? Uh, I don't have that much time, unfortunately, left, but um, to fully cover the topic. But then, then we have planetary system, right, which is being formed at some point in the in this this planet forming disks, as it was the case in our own uh, solar nebula, you know, when the solar system has formed. Uh, the very outdated plot, which is not fully correct, but essentially you have the clumps of this dust grain sedimenting towards the mid plane when they grow to millimeter centimeter sizes. Uh, eventually they can become so concentrated, become gravitationally unstable, then they form planetesimals of the size of 100, several hundred kilometers in diameter in a very short period of time, I guess several thousands of years. And then it depends what this planetesimals planetism are formed. So if they're formed in the out, like beyond, let's say, 5, 10 AU, then they're full of ices. They have a lot of trapped volatiles, let's say CO, but also water ice, but, but a lot of this organics uh, and so on. But if they're formed like where the Earth would form at around 1 AU, this was the warm inner region of the nebula and all this, these pebbles uh, were essentially very essentially ice-free, newly ice-free, I would say. So there were no volatiles, uh, the form of ice is present, only mm, trapped by chemisorption and so on. And therefore the planetesimals out of which, for example, Earth, Earth has formed have been extremely dry. And therefore it got a lot of the volatiles uh, later by, by the late accretion, at least the one that, that's on the surface. That would come with comets, but more likely with uh, planetesimals that formed slightly outside at uh, 2, 3 AU that are now, uh, that, that could have been also part of this, you know, as a part of carbonaceous uh, asteroids that, and meteorites that you can study today that sometimes they fall on the surface of the Earth. Anyway, that's that's the most important uh, message here, that the Earth has formed dry, it has not that much water on the surface, uh, a little bit more locked in the mantle, uh, not that much carbon as well on the surface. A lot of the carbon has been uh, locked into the core because the carbon is the element wants to stick to the to the to the metals. And as you know, the uh, Earth has has differentiated because of the heat and the gravity. We have metallic core and then the, you know the silicate mantle. So the carbon, a lot of carbon, is in the core, not in the surface or in the atmosphere. On the other hand, the carbonaceous planetesimals formed uh, not at one AU but at two three AU at cooler region of the nebula. They they retain some some water, uh, but a lot of volatiles like CO are not present, uh, were not present initially uh, in these things. So they're, a bit, they're more volatile rich, but uh, then, then the instatite uh, chondrites out of which Earth has formed, but at least more water rich than, than these things. But the comets, they retained essentially the pristine because they formed that, let's say between five to 20, 30 U in the solar nebula, they re remained pristine, volatile rich matter. Uh, essentially as what would be typical for, you know, um, outer parts of the 
proto style envelopes, maybe even you know the matter that would resemble the the matter in the uh, dense cloud cores. Anyway, very briefly to sum up. We know from the Rosetta mission, but also from the observations that comets have a lot of organics, including this, what we know from the dense cloud cores, like you know, met methanol and some alcohols, but also more complex ones like formic acids and then uh, precursors of, of um, uh, nu uh, nuclear bases like formamide, uh, HCN, and so on. We have detected also glycine, uh, glycine there. Uh, uh, with, with the stardust and the Rosetta missions. Um, uh, the water there have, is too enriched in the ethereum compared to the water on the surface, but they also have a lot of noble gases. Um, and so comets apparently could have delivered some, maybe one to 10% of water on the surface of the earth, but a lot of noble gases in the atmosphere, at least xenon, probably uh, uh, ha have come with, with the comets. Uh, by the way, this is this very nice uh, summary of the molecules detected by the Rosetta mission from Catherine Altwick review. Uh, for the asteroids, and here I'm talking about carbonations ones because they are important, could be important sources of organics, uh, uh, prebiotic organics in the early years. Um, these are the things that formed with some uh, icy organics and water uh, trapped in the pebbles. And they usually if they grow 200 to five, uh, 200 kilometers in diameter because of the decay of short li uh, lift radionuclides like 26 aluminum, they become warm enough to melt the water. So it would exist in the liquid form, but not too warm enough to start metamorpho uh, metamorphosis, uh, uh, you know, metamorphosis and differentiation of you know metals into the metal core like uh, like the planets do uh, and a lot of therefore a lot of this um, uh, aqueous chemistry uh, increasing the complexity of organic matter would occur there uh, we know the pieces of this from these carbonaceous asteroids for example here are Murchison on the left or on the right they could con contain up to 25% of water with the D2H ratio, which is very similar to the Earth's value. Then they have maybe up to 3% of carbon, mainly in, in soluble form, in forms of like aromatic uh, uh, macromolecular structures, but also 30% is the soluble form, mainly carboxylic acids that are important for the formation of membranes, could, could be at least in the early Earth. Then they uh, contain, um, uh, sorry, they can, can contain uh, various complex organics like adenine, guanine, xanthine, and so on, like nuclear bases. They have more than 70 amino acids, including eight proteinogenic ones, albeit with the high D2H ratio of like 10 minus 3. So these things, at least the precursors of those, should have formed in the low temperature part of the solar nebula or even dense cloud phase. Uh, and as I said, they have a lot of hydrocarbons as well, alcohols, and a lot of these other uh, things. Uh, interestingly, that amino acids in, in these uh, meteorites, they, they show uh, some kind of an, what is called an antiomeric excess or excess of left-hand uh, forms of, for example, isovalin, but a few of other amino acids, which just kind of reminds uh, what would happen what life prefers on the on, the, uh, on Earth, and the region, as I said, for that is, is a bit unclear. Could be circularly polarized UV light, but also maybe it's autocatalysis inside this carbonaceous asteroids and so on. Anyway, um, inside this, uh, as I said, uh, carbonaceous asteroids, a lot of this very interesting, very efficient organic synthesis could take place, like Shetrop that convert CO if it is present there and H2, presence of some metallic catalysts to hydrocarbons essentially, and some other things like let's say alcohols could be also aldehydes depending on the conditions. Uh, there is also formation of very efficient formation of sugars from, from formaldehyde. It could have happened also in the early years. It's called Formose reaction discovered by Butler, by the way, in Hamburg as well, where essentially formaldehyde is, is transport uh, is converted to uh, numerous aldehydes and then and then sugars uh, in the presence of divalent atoms like for example um, calcium and so on. Uh, it also works uh, on early earth would work with borate minerals. 
Then there is also Strecker synthesis that is forming essentially amino acids starting from uh, ammonia, then uh, for example, uh, HCN uh, and also aldehydes. Uh, it's also in the liquid uh, phase. Uh, but it produces some kind of racemic mixtures. Uh, essentially, the mixtures of amino acids, you know, this both left and right hand forms present equally. There was a recent uh, Hayabusa 2 and also a series 6 missions to one of these, to, to two carbonaceous asteroids, Ryugu and uh, Bennu. What Ryugu has found essentially, because it, the sample has been returned already in 2000, uh, 2020, they found uh, very rich OH rich minerals and OH rich compounds, also carbonates, as you know, like uh, the solid component. But what is interesting, they also found ribose sugar in this, uh, in this carbonaceous uh, asteroid, also vitamin B3, interstellar vitamin for the first time, many amino acids, and so on. In our group, by the way, we we have explained this. I have no time to talk much about. We have explained uh, this is a paper by our student Klaus Pashek. We have explained how ribose uh, synthesis occurs in the C type asteroids by using plantesimal models and uh, modeling the simplified thermos reaction in water uh, using laboratory measurements uh, from the group of uh, Professor Trapp by Kai Kohler. And, and so on. So we could explain the synthesis of ribose and also, by the way, partly amino acids and by the way, interstellar uh, vitamin B3, um, which we're still working on uh, to publish. Um, so, so to wrap up my talk, uh, this this how the, uh, the, you know the chemical complexity evolves in space, starting from dense clouds all the way to comets and also carbonaceous asteroids. And then uh, from the isoto analyzing isotopic signatures in these uh, various primitive bodies, but also in the planets uh, of the solar system, we could kind of uh, estimate how much has been delivered. As I said, you know, Earth has formed dry, but about 0.5% of this weight had been accreted later, maybe with partly with carb using carbonaceous asteroids, maybe comets. Well, comets should have delivered maybe one to 10% of water, a lot of noble gases and organics into this atmosphere. And carbonaceous uh, asteroids would deliver maybe 90% of the surface water organics, maybe a lot of organics, but it's unclear how much. And the big question now, which I would, uh, would, would, would uh, leave unanswered is, uh, how much of this stuff would survive the delivery on the surface of the uh, early Earth? And how much of this organics could have been produced in situ by you know, the atmospheric processes or the processes in the, in the primitive ocean? Uh, so this would be like the open questions of my talk that, that, that would remain un, uh, unanswered for the time being. Here are my conclusions. So I, I hope you, you, you you could understand that chemical complexity evolves um, very efficiently, even under the space conditions, uh, that the our formation of complex organics begins already in the very cold, dense clouds, which end up probably as a pristine matter in the comets. Uh, then the, during star formation and planet formation, this complexity in organics increases. And then there's the further growth in complexity inside carbonaceous asteroids that form, by the way, fatty acids, nuclear bases, amino acids, sugars, all these key components for the origin of life. And now the big question, we don't know the answer to yet, the delivery versus in situ processes on Earth. What was the key, the dominant pathways for the prebiotic organics and for the origin of life to appear? Um, and the answer is still unclear. So thank you my, uh, very much for your attention and uh, I open for questions.